Psalms 46, 1 through 2 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change and though the mountains would slip into the heart of the sea. Beloved, when we went through Psalm 46 two weeks ago, and we preached through that, we had no idea what God was preparing us for. We had no idea what God was preparing the Kimball family for. You've read my email, and you've heard the news that Tuesday night, Kurt and Linda's 16-year-old son Joshua was killed when he lost control of the car that he was driving. And for all of us, when we first heard the news, time seemed to stand still. Everything at that moment that we thought was so important, that we were so concerned about, suddenly was insignificant. Beloved, our God is big enough for things like this, for things exactly like this. This is the exact kind of trouble when he can be our very present help. I think, of course, the question all of you are asking is, how are Kurt and Linda doing? They're here with us, which tells us a lot. To hear them sing, to hear their voices sing, Christ is our sure and steady anchor, proclaims and says everything. Kurt and Linda, we love you so much. You helped start this church. And you've been an integral part of many of our lives for many more years than that, before that, over 30 years. And our hearts bear this burden with you. And it's a joy for us to feel that burden. And I know, I've talked to our people, they feel that burden with you. And this is what Galatians 6 talks about when it says, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. And so that's our joy and our delight. And... As many of you ask, it's no surprise that their faith is carrying them through this. This is where Christianity really works. This is when we know that Christianity is really true. The world has no answers for situations like this. They're grieving deeply, and yet as Paul the Apostle said, we don't grieve as those who have no hope at all because we truly have hope. And they are finding hope, and as I've heard them share, and they will, Kurt particularly will share more at the memorial service, they are finding hope in the character of our good, loving, sovereign, and kind and wise God, a hope that our human minds cannot comprehend. But they also find hope in the gospel, in the fact that Joshua knew the gospel, Joshua affirmed Christ as his Savior and Lord, and recently in God's kindness, particularly Joshua showing an increased tenderness to the Lord that many people had observed. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, it says that for the believer to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's the joy, that's the hope that we have. And for four days, for four days, Joshua has been with his Savior, in unimaginable peace and joy that we can only look forward to and long for all the more. I know, speaking on behalf of Kurt and Linda and the entire Kimball family, they so much appreciate your prayers for them and all the words and calls and different things you've sent and ways you've encouraged them. They feel that. They sense that so much um, as the body of Christ and even broader than just our body, obviously the whole body of Christ uh, in many, many ways. Um, there's much more to say, a lot more to say, and so we would invite you to come to the memorial service, and that will be here at Christ Hope Bible Church this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock, and we encourage you to come and be a part of that, and there will be an opportunity to worship the Lord, to praise the Lord, to give glory to God, and to bless the Lord. That's what we will do, and thank you so much for your continued and prayers for Kurt and Linda uh, at this time. I'm going to pray in a moment, but what word would God have us to say? What word would God have for us this morning? I was in the middle of finishing up uh, uh, my, the sermon that I was supposed to preach this morning on Genesis chapter 1 uh, when I heard the news of Josh's death. And it's very important. Genesis is very important. We will get to Genesis. Uh, we will get there. It'll be next Sunday when I introduce it. 
Uh, but I really prayed. I sought the Lord. God, what would you speak to us? What word would you have for us <clears throat> this morning? And my heart continued to perfectly gravitate in a particular direction. It gravitated to Christ's words in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, where, where Christ in that very context gives hope to troubled hearts. And I believe this is a word not just for the Kimball family, but for all of us, the family of God, as we need to hear in situations like this, what does God say to us? How does Christ speak uh, to us? I believe there will be a word for each one of us that we can find healing for troubled hearts. Before we look at that, let's go ahead and pray and talk to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we have fixed our hope on you, the living God. Thank you for your tender grace. Thank you for your mercies that you have poured out on Kurt and Linda and their family as they are looking to you with confident faith and confident hope at the home going of Josh. And yet, Father, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. We have confident hope that brings a, a peace. It even brings a joy at a time like this that the world cannot understand, a hope that, a hope that fuels worship of you and gives us a greater awe and a wonder of you. Christ, you are the sure and steady anchor. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope steadfast and sure, and one which enters within the veil. Christ, you are that anchor of our soul. You entered the holy presence of our heavenly Father, and you offered yourself as the perfect sacrifice for our sins, for all who believe in you. Because of that, all of us who come to you in trusting faith, we will dwell in your presence forever and ever. And oh God, may that give us hope, hope that overflows in worship and awe and wonder of you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Heaven. What comes to your mind when you think about heaven? Or is your life so consumed with so many other things and issues and earthly concerns that you rarely have a, a passing thought of eternity? Henry Veen came to Christ in the 18th century under the ministry of evangelist George Whitfield. And Henry became a minister of the gospel. And for many, many years, he faithfully proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. And then he retired. Henry retired, and he lived near his son in Huddersfield, England. And at one point, he became very seriously ill, and he was on his deathbed. But when Henry was told that he was dying, this made him so joyful that his doctor said that his excitement at dying and being with Christ kept him alive for another two weeks. Now that's looking forward to heaven. That's looking forward to being with God. Beloved, do you anticipate eternity? Or are you distracted by the troubles and the difficulties and the struggles of life? Are, we, are you overwhelmed with the, the burdens of today? If you haven't turned there already, turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3, and, and Christ is going to give us a glimpse of heaven. This is one of those sweet windows in God's word that kind of opens up to us and, and opens up to us and allows us to gaze into eternity and allows us to see what will the future be like? What will heaven be like? Scripture is very clear. It's very clear that your view of your heavenly home will have a dramatic impact on your daily life. How you view your heavenly home will have a dramatic impact on your daily life. Let me read John 14, verses 1 through 3. This is Christ speaking, speaking to the disciples, but he's speaking to each one of us 2,000 years later down through the centuries. And what does he say to us? He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are, are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. 
If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And there's really a central thrust, a central theme to these three verses. And what is that? Is that you need to look to your heavenly dwelling with Christ to settle your troubled heart. You need to look to your heavenly dwelling with Christ to settle your troubled heart. And in this passage, we will see three essential truths if you're going to have an eternal perspective. First, we will see that we need to, to stop. Stop being troubled. And secondly, Christ will encourage us to see his sacrifice. And then thirdly, we will see a call to savor Christ's presence. Well, first, Christ says in John 14, 1, he calls us to, to stop being troubled. He says there in verse 1, do not let your heart be troubled. This word troubled means to, to shake something violently. It means to stir something up very vigorously. And if you know the contents, context of John 14, you know why Christ is saying this. Where are the disciples in John 14? In John 14, Christ and his disciples, they are in the upper room. This is the last supper as they're gathered around with Christ right before his betrayal and then the trials and then his death. And it's like the enveloping darkness of a setting sun. They're realizing that what Jesus had told them many times before in the previous years, they're realizing that his death is going to happen soon, very soon. In fact, they realize they are on the eve of that as it draws closer and closer. It's truly only hours away. Christ could read their hearts like a billboard. He knew what they were struggling with. They couldn't feel his pain, but he could feel their pain. He knew. Why? Because everything in their world is, is falling apart. Only a week before, what did we have? We had the triumphal entry where Christ enters in at a fever pitch into Jerusalem. Everyone's shouting at the top of their lungs, Hosanna to the son of David. They laid down palm branches. They threw their cloaks before him. The disciples had thought, it. this is it. This is it. Christ's kingdom is, is coming now. He will be the king, and we will rule with him. That was just a week before. But just when their excitement became uncontainable throughout this previous week, what has Christ been talking to them about again and again and again? He's been reminding them, he's been talking to them over and over about his impending death. They don't know exactly when it's going to be, but he does. And that has been so confusing for them, particularly here as they're gathered at the Last Supper. How could he be the Messiah? How could the Messiah die? And so their dreams, their desires are unraveling. And that's the context of John 14. And the way Christ words this, it actually has the idea of stop being troubled. He's wanting to, to, to stop having, being consumed with worry and concern and anxiousness. He's not saying, just in case this happens, don't be troubled. No, he is speaking to troubled hearts who are being consumed with that trouble. And he is saying, stop being troubled. Now, once again, here we, we see Christ's grace. We see Christ's tenderness. Beloved, who deserves to be comforted in this situation? Who was facing the most gruesome of deaths in only a, a few hours? Who will momentarily bear the awesome wrath of God against all of our sin? And yet, even to the very end, when he's facing his own pain, when he's facing his own turmoil, when he's facing his own death, Christ's love for his disciples never skips a beat. He loved them to the end. And really, these three verses here are, are some of the most loving words that Christ shares with his disciples in these last hours before his death. And the fact of the matter is, is all of our lives, 
All of our lives are characterized by trouble, by tears, by pain, by difficulty. And so these words speak to us, speak to you, speak to me now, here, today. So how do we not let our hearts be troubled? He says, stop letting your hearts be troubled. How is that possible? What do we do? Well, look at verse 1, the last phrase. He says what? Believe in God. Believe also in me. Now, if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, you know this brings to the fore the central theme of John's Gospel. In John chapter 20, verse 30, it tells us what the theme is. It says, these things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. And so that's the thrust of the book of John. And Christ is saying it right here. This is the answer for troubled hearts. Belief, faith, trust in God. But what kind of belief is is Christ talking about here in, in John 14, 1. This isn't the initial belief for salvation. Well, why? Because the men he's talking to, they've all been saved. Judas has left the room. He's not in there anymore. And this word translated believe in the Greek text, it's in the, what's called the present tense, which means it's, a, it's an ongoing, continual belief. He isn't saying just have a one-time belief back in the past. He is calling them to a life of faith, a life of belief. He is challenging these men to keep on trusting God, keep on trusting him. He was 11.6. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. The Christian life is a life of faith. That's it. Every day. Not just the day you came to Christ. The day you came to Christ, that was the first step of faith. And in the rest of your life, your walk with Christ is a walk of faith and dependence. But according to John 14 here, what's the object of this faith? What's the object of this belief? Christ says, believe in God. Believe also in me. Here we have the object of our faith. He isn't saying, well, just believe whatever you want to believe. That's no, very clear. God's word is very clear. There's only one object of faith, one object of belief that truly will will settle and will heal a troubled heart. And what is that? It's faith in Christ, faith in the Lord Jesus, faith in his person and work. And this prescription for troubled hearts is timeless. It's not just for those disciples in the first century. It's for us, for each of us here today now none of us will be in the same situation these men were in but every one of us each of us often will face circumstances will face situations in our lives of of great upheaval of great turmoil of great anxiousness and all of these all of these crises and difficulties are a test and they're always a test of what what will we trust in? What will we depend in? Depend on where is the anchor of our soul placed? That's what it is. We must hope in something, in someone outside of ourselves. There's a reason Lamentations 3, 21 to 23 is so dear to God's people. Where Jeremiah says at the lowest point of Israel's history, he says, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What will destroy the the giant of despair in your life? What is it? Placing your hope, placing your faith firmly in God and his promises and who he is. 
Recall to the forefront of your mind Scripture's promises that you have, you have a loving and faithful God and that His compassions never fail. What's the only thing that will take away the disciples' fear here in this situation? What is it? A firm belief in the character and the person of Christ. Christ is calling them and He's calling us. He is saying, believe in me, trust in me. And brothers and sisters, this is, this is one of the main reasons that God brings crises, God brings predicaments into our lives. Why? Because he wants us to trust him. He takes away everything else that we had relied on because he wants to have our anchor in him alone because then he is glorified. Then he is put on display in a magnificent way. From despair, we hope in God, which leads to praising him for his presence. Not praising him because he took the trial away and made everything the way we wanted it to be. No, praising him for the help of his presence. Even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of distress, even in the midst of the deepest sorrow, that we can praise God and look to Christ in faith. By faith, clinging to his person. By faith, clinging to his work on the cross. And then, through that faith, experiencing true peace and strength that he can provide. So, Christ is saying to hear, hear first to the disciples, he is saying, stop being troubled. And he's saying that to us as well. He's saying, stop being troubled. He, he isn't saying you aren't troubled because he knows that. He knows he knows troubled hearts. He knows they're troubled. He knows when we're troubled. He's calling to, to stop being troubled. But how? What is it that they were to believe in? Is it just kind of in a, a vague concept of uh, Jesus? What is it? What is it that they are to believe in? What about Christ? What about Christ is it that will calm the troubled heart? We need to see Christ's sacrifice. And that's in verse 2. Look at John 14, 2. He says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. These are rightly some of the most well-loved verses in, in all of God's Word. Because clinging to a future certainty gives hope in the present struggle. Clinging to a future certainty gives hope in the present struggle. And our Lord here, he paints one of the most beautiful pictures of, of heaven here. What does he call heaven? What does he call it here? I love it. He says, it's my father's house. It's my father's house. There's something very touching and, and very comforting in the thought of heaven we look forward to that it's, it's our Father's house. It's, it's home. I must confess, I, I'm a real home buddy. I am. And it's not our house. There's actually a lot of things about our house I don't like. Uh, it's not our house. No. It's, I treasure. I treasure being with the family that I love. I tra treasure being with those that, that love me. That's what a home is all about. And so when Christ here paints the picture of our Father's house, that's what he's talking about. Human beings, we long for home. We long for a place of security. We long for a place of acceptance. We long for a place of, of love. No, I know, certainly, there are some here that when you, you think about that, you may have bad memories of growing up in an earthly Father's house but every person, every person ha still has a, a dream of home, a longing for home. And, and all of us know instinctively what Christ is talking about here when he speaks of heaven as his Father's house. Where is your home? Where is your home? Where's your home? Beloved, your, your real home, it's not the address on your license plate. I mean, on your, on your license that you have in your wallet. Your real home isn't the, the place where you sleep at night. Your real home isn't where you get your mail. No. 
Your, your earthly home, and, and as precious as that is, your earthly home, what is it? It's just a picture. It's a picture, a symbol that points ahead to a, a greater reality. It points to your heavenly home. But what is that heavenly home like? What is that heavenly home like? There are many things that Christ in this very teachable moment could have told his disciples about what heaven is like. It's glorious. It's magnificent. It's beautiful. And it'll be all those things. But Christ doesn't talk about any of those things. What aspect of heaven will give his disciples courage for what they are about to walk through? What is it? Look what he says in verse 2. He says, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, what does he mean when you say dwelling places? You need to understand what he's talking about when he talks about dwelling places or or, or rooms. I grew up with the well-loved King James Version, and many of you are familiar with that. And and how does John 14.2 read in the King James Version? It says, in my Father's house are, are many mansions. Now, in the 17th century, when that was translated, it had a different nuance, and that was actually a a quite good translation. But it can be very confusing for us in in our modern times as we read back into what that would mean, where someone would say, well, I've never really had a nice home in in this life, but in heaven, I'm going to have a mansion. Or we look at verse 3, and and people would say, well, it says that Jesus is preparing a place for me, and if it's taking him over 2,000 years to do that, it must be stunningly beautiful. I can hardly wait to live in my my mansion in heaven. Are you serious? Do you really think that Christ sacrificed his precious life on the cross so we could get to heaven and and feed our earthly lusts and desires, which we won't even have when we're there. When we're in heaven, we'll be freed from every, uh, every earthly attraction, in a sense, and we'll be drawn to Christ. So what does it mean when he talks about dwelling place or room? This word is only used one other time in the entire Greek New Testament, and it's actually in this chapter. It's several verses later. If you run your finger down your Bible, down to verse 23, and you see he actually uses this exact same word. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and here's our word, and make our abode with him. That's the word. That's the word that's used in John 14, 2. So what is this dwelling or room referred to? It's a a place to dwell. It's a place to abide. It's a place to call home. That's what it is. Now, some translations uh, give the idea, in my father's house there are many rooms. And that's okay, but that also can be misleading because you have to be careful um, because that could convey the idea that we're kind of all separate from one another. I'm in my room, and you're in your room, and we're separate from the Lord. And they're just kind of rooms all over heaven with, with signs. You know, there's David's room, and there's Amy's room, and there's Chris's room, and there's Cindy's room, and there's Beth's room in heaven, or whatever. You, you'll have your own room in, in heaven with your, your name on it. But, but that's not what Christ is talking about here at all. How many houses are there in this verse? How many are there? One. One. And sometimes I think we picture heaven like kind of a, a, a magnificent real estate development. You know, there's streets of gold, and all along those streets of gold, there, there are ha- houses, mansions, kind of all throughout that. Now, now, Christ has the biggest mansion, and it's in the center, but we each have our own houses. That's not the way it is at all. What does this text indicate? There's one house. And that's God's dwelling, beloved. And that's where we were, will all live together, focused on the Lord. Revelation 7, 9 says, After these things I looked, and here's a picture of heaven that, that John gives to us, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing where? Before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. That's where we'll be. That's where we'll be all together in the presence of Christ. So how does Christ calm their troubled hearts? How does he calm our troubled hearts? 
What will give them the courage they need? They must look to their heavenly dwelling with Christ to settle their troubled hearts. Now, some of, us, some of you, no doubt, will be thinking, well, how is that possible? And they're probably thinking that too. How is this possible? How is this going to work out? Well, he tells them in verse 2 at the end. He says, in my father's house are, are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. He would have told them if that wasn't the case. But then here's the key phrase. For I go to prepare a place for you. What does it mean when Christ says, I I go to prepare a place for you? We need to think very carefully here, very thoughtfully. What does it mean? What is Christ saying to the disciples? What is he saying to us when he says, I go to prepare a, a place for you? Now, what do we tend to think of when we read this verse? Well, we we think that, well, Christ is in heaven right now. He's working. He's preparing a place for us. Kind of like a divine general contractor building the rooms in heaven where Christians will live in his father's house. One of the versions I read kind of conveys this idea when it says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to heaven to prepare a place for you. So when that conveys the idea that, you know, I'm going there to prepare a place for you, it conveys that that Christ is going to heaven to get our room ready for us. But the problem is, is the word there is not in the Greek text. It's not there. Because that's not what he's talking about. That's not what Christ said. And I don't believe that's what Christ intended at all. Go back to the beginning of verse 2. What does it say? It says, in my Father's house... Are, present tense, are many dwelling places. Don't miss the obvious from God's word, what he's saying to us. At the time that Christ spoke these words, there was already a dwelling place in heaven for every disciple and for every person that would come to faith in Christ. Christ doesn't need 2,000 years or more to prepare a, a dwelling place for all of his people. He created this whole universe in six days. And when Christ made your heavenly dwelling place in eternity past, it was complete. It was complete. There was nothing that needed to be added to it where you and I will dwell with God. You say, well, okay, then if that's not what he's talking about, what does it mean when Christ says that he's, that he's going to prepare a place for us? What's the context of John 14? Where is Christ going right after this? Remember, this is the Last Supper. This is on the eve of Christ going to the cross to prepare a place for all who had come to him in faith. That is what will prepare a place for you. That is what will prepare a place for every disciple. Heaven is perfect. Heaven is perfect totally ready for you from eternity past. But what is it that must have a major transformation? You, me. Christ is going to the cross so that your sin could be paid for, so that you could be reconciled and you could dwell in the presence of a holy God without sin. That's how he's going to prepare or make a way for a place for you. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. Why? Why did he do that? So that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Beloved, Christ is going to the cross. Christ is going to the cross to prepare a way so that you could be with God forever. Beloved, John 14, 2 is about Christ's work on the cross, not about some heavenly construction project. It's about Christ preparing a way through his death. He entered heaven as our high priest. He presented his perfect sacrifice for our sins. He removed the barrier that sin made between us and God. And even now, 
Even now at this very moment, he is interceding to God on your behalf. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. So what is it? What is it that prepares a a place? What is it that, that makes a way for you to be with God forever? What is it? Christ's death on the cross. Every sin that that you have ever committed, every sin that you will ever commit in the rest of your life, Christ paid for that. He satisfied the wrath of God. And so when you stand before God, you will not stand before God in shame. You will stand before God holy and blameless. You will present it before God as a wonderful trophy of his grace and his son's sacrifice. You will be ready for heaven and eternal communion with him. So what should that cause us to do? We need to set our minds on heaven a lot more. Obviously, all of us in this past week have thought about heaven a lot. We have. But we need to do that all the time because it will change the way we live today. 19th century Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was an unbeliever, he once said, some people are so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. You've heard that before. It's not true. It's not true at all. It's not true at all. Because Christians who are truly heavenly minded, who are doing what Christ calls them to do here, will do the most earthly good. That's exactly what Christ is encouraging his disciples to He's painting a heavenly vision for them so they would see what they are headed to. They're, gonna, they're about to go through unbelievable difficulty in just a few, a very short amount of time. And so they're troubled, they're disturbed, they're discouraged. They can, they can hear, in a sense, in the, the back room, they can hear what's coming. So he doesn't flatter them with worth, worthless platitudes like, like, hang on, you'll make it. Don't worry, be happy. No, he shifts the gaze of their souls from earth to heaven where God dwells. Because he knew that if they had a vivid view of heaven, they would be able to endure any hardship, any difficulty, any trial. Do you think about heaven very much? Because, beloved, our lives on this earth, whether we're 16, whether we're 60, or 100, is momentary. It's virtually nothing in light of eternity. We should long for heaven. We should talk about heaven with one another, with our kids, with with fellow believers. I know for me, for quite a while, the Lord's been planting in my soul a deepening longing, a greater desire to be with Christ in heaven. And I trust that's true for you as, as well. Now, you need to be patient, though, because each one of us has a role here. God has a role for each person here that he's put you on this earth for. That You need to wait for his perfect timing and for him to, to determine that. But there should be a, a continual struggle, a, a drawing like a, a magnet that's pulling us relentlessly toward the eternal presence of dwelling with God forever. But that will affect how we serve him here. Philippians 1, 22 to 23, Paul echoed that tension of the believer when he says, but if I am to live on in the flesh... That will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. I'm hard-pressed from both directions. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. That is very much better. Beloved, a a longing for heaven will give perspective and it will help sustain you through the struggles, the difficulties, through the trials, through the pleasure and pain and sorrows of this life. But why? Why? Why should a Christian long for heaven so much? What should draw our hearts to our heavenly home? We've seen that we need to stop being troubled. We've seen that we need to see Christ's sacrifice. Let's look finally in verse 3. It's so that we can savor Christ's presence. Look at verse 3. Christ says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself 
that where I am, there you may be also. Love, this is an astonishing promise. Christ says that if he goes and prepares a a way for his followers to dwell with God, he says, if I'm going to go prepare a way for you, and he's going to do it, and it's the cross, he says, if I'm going to do that, then you can know with confidence that I will come back for you. You say, well, what does it mean that Christ is going to come again? Jesus is coming back. God's word declares that. Revelation 19 describes the second coming of Christ. Glorious picture. Revelation 19, 11 to 13 says, And I saw heaven. John sees, in a, in a sense, looking down through the many years. He looks and he says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. That's Christ. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, the living Word of God. Jesus, Jesus is coming back. Maranatha, even so come, Lord Jesus. But the disciples that Jesus is talking to here, they died long before Christ's second coming. And we may very possibly, very probably, die before the second coming of Christ. So is this a a shallow promise? Is this a hollow promise? No, because there is a sense that at death, our Lord comes to receive his children to himself. Psalm 23, one of the most well-loved psalms in all of God's Word, says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When that time comes for each one of us, when we walk through death's valley, We need to have no fear, no fear, because of this promise, because Christ personally will come, will come and lead us to heaven where we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So not only is Christ preparing a way, but he's promising that he's going to come back and and take us there. The Lord is not going to send someone to get you not going to send Michael or, or Gabriel or any other angel. Our Lord Jesus will take us home personally. And when it comes time for each of us to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we can know a certainty that our Savior will be right there with us, closer than we can imagine. Because of that, the, the Christian need have no fear of death, not no fear of what lies on the other side, but even death because Christ will walk with us. So our Lord is coming back. Whether we're a part of that glorious generation where we're there for the second coming, or we will meet him face to face the moment we die. And why? What's the purpose? Why will Christ come back for us? Why does Christ prepare a a way for us? Well, what does it say in the text? Look at verse 3. At the end, verse 3, it says very clearly, why? Here's why. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there, there you may be also. Beloved, this is such a sweet and precious promise for the believer. Jesus didn't, in this verse, Jesus doesn't say, I will come again and take you to heaven. Even that's true. That's not what he says here. Not at all. He says something far more comforting. He says, I will come again and will bring you to myself. Because that's the whole point. Our loving Savior's primary concern isn't just to get you to heaven. He wants you to bring you to himself. So because of that, why should heaven be so attractive to every believer? Why should it draw us? Why should we long for that? It's not a mansion or streets of gold. It's not earthly delights or pleasures. 
It's not even freedom from sorrow or, or pain or sickness. It's not even being united with our loved ones who have died in the Lord before us. No, what is it about heaven that you draw us irresistibly like a magnet? What is it? Everlasting delight, everlasting joy. And that joy is not found in anything else but the person of Christ in God himself. Now, we're all very curious what heaven is going to be like. But read through the scriptures, it leaves most of our questions unanswered. There's just not a lot there. We don't need to speculate because scripture declares the most important reality about heaven. And what is that? That's where Jesus is. That's where Christ is. And that's why the Christian longs for heaven, to be with Christ. Revelation 22, 3 through 5, the Apostle John gives another picture. He says, talking about heaven, there will no longer be any curse. Praise God. No curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his bondservants will serve him. You're going to serve Christ for all eternity and you'll love it. They will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night. And they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Beloved, what will be your greatest joy of heaven? What does it say in that text? You will see his face. You will see Christ face to face. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, we are of good courage. What gives us courage? I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. There is no no man's land. There is no purgatory for God's people. There is no waiting place. To be absent from the, Lord, to be absent from the body is immediately to be in the presence of the Lord. God's word doesn't say to be absent from the body is to be in heaven. It doesn't say that. That's true, but it says to be absent from the body is to be what? At home with the Lord, because Christ is what defines heaven, Christ. And that's why we long for heaven, because we long to be with our Lord. Our sin will be gone, praise God. There will be no hindrances to our praise and our worship of Christ. We'll be all gathered together and, and we'll all, all of us will be sinless. You'll have an overwhelming love for one another, but that love will be centered in the person and work of Christ. You'll have no difficulty expressing your love to Christ. Your soul will burn with a love for Christ that you have a longing for now. It will have that kind of love for Christ and you will worship him fully in the, the greatest delight and the greatest joy. And that's what calms troubled hearts. That's what Christ speaks to his disciples. And that's what Christ speaks to us 2,000 years later is what calms troubled hearts. Look to your heavenly dwelling with Christ. Look to your heavenly dwelling with Christ to settle your troubled heart. Stop being troubled. See Christ's sacrifice and savor Christ's presence. Do you long for heaven? Do you long for heaven? Now, there's some here as you read this, if you're honest, you have to say, no, I, I don't have that, that longing because I know, if I'm honest, I know that I am not right with Christ. I know I have never come to him in faith and repentance. And so, in that, there is no encouragement for you to look forward to heaven because that is not where you are headed you're headed, God's word is very clear for a Christless eternity. The amazing delight and joy of heaven, the polar opposite to that is to those who choose not to look to Christ in this life for trust and dependence. Christ died on the cross. He made a way by taking the wrath of God so that all who would believe in him, they can be right with him forever. And I trust and I pray, I urge you 
The things of this week have given us all an eternal perspective, haven't they? What's really important. But if you don't know Christ, would you be ready if you stood before your Creator in a moment? Would you be prepared? But as a believer, do you long for heaven? Or is your heart so entangled with so many other things there's no room to think of eternal things? Does your soul long and yearn for the presence of God? A a clear vision of heaven and communion with Christ is what each of us need for every situation we face. No matter the difficulty, no matter the struggle, no matter the challenge, beloved, look, look to your heavenly dwelling with Christ to settle your troubled heart. It doesn't matter how Bad things have happened circumstantially in your life. If you are right with God, you're going to be with Christ forever. But beloved, who can look with confidence to heaven with Christ? Who is it? Who can look with confidence to what Christ is telling us here? What about for sinners? What about for really, really, really bad sinners? What about for all of us who struggle deeply to live for God's glory and have such imperfect Christian lives? What confidence can we have as we look at our own lives? Beloved, that's exactly who Christ is talking to here. Why? How do you know that? It's no accident. What is the verse right before John 14:1? It's John 13, 38, where Christ says, Will you, Peter, lay down your life for me? Peter's just been bragging. I'll stand up for you, Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow before you deny me three times. That's right before this promise, what Christ gives us, which gives me hope, which gives you hope, because that's exactly the kind of person that Christ is telling not to be troubled. It's to those who believe in him. It's not to those who depend on their self-righteousness. It's not to those who depend on their own works. It's to those who cast themselves on the grace of God. Peter is about to have the most devastating failure. Devastating. And his only hope, his only hope, will be to remember Christ's words. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Beloved, this is a call for each one of us. Each one of us. Yes, we can see how the disciples did cling to these words. Look what happens to them after Christ dies and then resurrects. Look at the lives that they lived as they lived based on what Christ had promised to them. But may we do the same. May we let not our hearts be troubled because we're believing in God. We're believing in Christ. So I urge you, I plead with you, look. Look to your heavenly dwelling with Christ to settle your troubled heart. Let's pray. Talk to the Lord. I don't know what's troubling your heart in these moments. Christ does. Christ knows what's troubling your heart. And he is speaking these words to you. How will a renewed view of your heavenly dwelling with Christ, how will that heal your troubled heart's heart? Talk to Christ even now. Affirm your belief in him and ask for his grace so that you can continue to trust in him. Christ, we don't just need to hear these words once. We need to, hear, need to hear them many times, what you say here to your disciples and then to us. Because there's so many times, each of us, every day, where we need to let not our hearts be troubled. But we are concerned about so many things. And may every trouble that comes our way, 
May it cause us to look to you and to look to our heavenly dwelling with you. And we need your grace to do that. Because in our humanness, we turn inside. We look to our own resources. So we need your grace to remind us again and again of our heavenly dwelling with you. Christ, the love that you convey for your disciples and for us here is just overwhelming because you want us not to be troubled and you've provided the resources so we can walk with you in joy and delight even in the midst of trouble. Thank you, Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.